All right, I heard someone drank my limited edition soda can. Who would dare ruin the Pepsi generation? Come out now and I might let you off with a trip to the- <laughs> you guys, you shouldn't have. Happy birthday to you. <laughs> Happy birthday, sweetie. <laughs> Happy birthday, boss. Aw, oh, thanks, man. But, um, my birthday isn't for another few months. I think you have the wrong information and a nice-looking cigar. Why not? Well, all right, I'll appreciate what I have. Which is the Pepsi can, right? No one actually drank that? Man, this was the best birthday ever. I even got to spar with Silent Mastodon for a while. <sighs> well, I heard it was gonna rain soon. I should probably head inside. <laughs> Quiet? What do you think you're doing? Okay, that's pretty cute, but you totally could have killed me. Well, at least I got my cigar. Probably could have held it with my fingers instead, but I live for the thrill. Well, I'd say it's time for bed. Wait, what's this? Whoa, guys, your form sucks. Do better. Here, I'll give you pointers. Yeah, no, we're not doing that. Those are for enemies. And again, that was embarrassing form. You wanna stab someone good? Here, I'll show you. <laughs> oh. <sighs> it was just a dream. Where am I? Oh, that's right. That kid. He threw a bottle at my head while I was distracted. Well, White Mamba, you landed a cheap shot. Congratulations. But don't expect that to work again. You're way outside your depth. In fact, Tell you what, kiddo, I won't leave this room. Yeah, you're supposed to be a mini-boss, but I barely even need to participate to beat you. So take all the time you need, attack me any way you want. You're not hitting me again. Nope, sorry, try again. Man, why do you have all these weapons laying around if you don't even know how to use them? Yeah, that's not happening again. Ooh, a sneak attack. That's not bad, but my hearing is unmatched despite one of my eardrums being ruptured. I'll give you this. If you were facing anyone but me, Quiet, Ocelot, Silent, Mastodon, or Kaz on a good day, you'd be a fair challenge. But that's not the reality of your situation. Race with Ryan is down the hall, kid. You're playing the wrong game. And look at that! The leader gets beat up and all the minions flee the scene. Take this as a lesson in loyalty. You provided all of them with invaluable knowledge on how to survive, and they repay you by surviving as far away as they can from you. But at Mother Base, you can trust Bastard Moose, he's a good guy. Oh, and uh, Pequod. He's the pilot, and a damn good one too. So here, I'll free you. Get up and hop in. Obstinate little shit, aren't you? Well, whatever. At least put on his seatbelt. Alright, uh, well, while we head back, I'm gonna grade the mission. You can ignore it, don't worry, it's just something I do. This mission is okay. Pretty short, and as was shown, the mini-boss was nothing special. But some of the side objectives are neat. For instance, you could actually neutralize the White Mama before he even has the chance to fight back. Yeah, just trank him from a distance and you're good to go. Guess you just needed an extra nap time, right? <laughs> But then there's one for extracting 20 children. But even since pitch dark, I still don't have the means to just fault in them. That would mean bringing all 20 to the helicopter. But there is a different way. While your Fultons don't work on kids, D-Walkers do. Using the Fulton Ballista gets the job done, although doing the whole mission like that is... 
interesting. There's also a Fulton rocket launcher you can buy that does the same thing, so if you bring both of those, it should be a piece of cake. Although I don't see why you can't just wait a few more missions to get the Fulton upgrade either. This is just if you have a serious OCD about doing side objectives as they come, like me. And while we're at this, why don't we go back and grade the last few missions as well? Retake the platform is short and sweet. It serves as a simple way of introducing the FOB system, and I'd say it does a pretty good job. There are no side objectives, nor is there a grade you can get, so this is more of a one and done. But it works well with that role, B tier. The war economy is meh, which is how I feel about the concept as well. It kind of works as an ultimate test of your eavesdropping skills if you go that route. But if you don't, then all you have to do is walk in, grab the PF official, and crate Fulton out of there. And you know I like that versatility. Aside from that though, it's fine. C tier. Why do my dreams always end with me getting stabbed on my birthday? Alright, we're here. This is Mother Base, home of the Diamond Dogs. Don't worry, there are other kids here. We set up a little playpen on the medical platform. I know it's a strange place to have it, but it seems to be where all the important stuff is. <laughs> You know, to an extent I can relate. I was a bit rebellious as a kid too. Although for me it was more find the electronics my mom hid for me as punishment so I can keep playing Five Nights at Fuckboys in secret and less try to kill anyone for any perceived disrespect. Listen up, Eli. There are rules around here and you're gonna follow them. You will never beat me in a fight. So cut the tween angst and go to your room. Ocelot, make sure the air conditioning's working in his room, but not too cold, and if he's hungry, get him some snacks. Well, back to business, I guess. Back to Pequod. Okay, so what were we up to before this? Right, the disease. We've seen it multiple times up close and yet have nothing to go on as a cause. Everyone we've been able to get an answer from has either had nothing to say that we didn't know already or died. Well, maybe our luck will finally change with this mission. While I was busy with the last one, some more wild and wacky stuff happened. Mainly, we found two researchers who've been studying this mystery disease, and they've even been welcomed as guests to the lovely hotel we visited earlier. I have to know more about this thing. Problem is, for one reason or another, they've been taken prisoner by one of the private forces. Our goal is to rescue the two and help them escape the country. Simple enough. I'll bring Dee Dee with me this time around. I've maxed out his bond so I can change his color just like with D-Horse. I usually make him black and brown because that's the same color as King. Although he's pretty gray now, you know, he's getting on in years. But fox color is pretty fitting this time, wouldn't you agree? I could also remove his little eye patch or give him an artificial one to replace it. Although, I don't know why you would, the eye patch is cool. He's just like us! Anyway, let's get down to it. Just me, or is that title kind of concerning? Fittingly enough, they're being held at a guard post close to where the Devil's House was. We're on a pretty strict time limit. Eventually, a squad of three will come around to pick them up and haul them off to who knows where. But at the same time, this place is pretty damn crowded. While I, and by I I mean Dee Dee, recons the area, I'll take this opportunity to place a few vehicle stunning mines on the road, just so those guys don't end up getting in the way. Funnily enough though, in the time it took me to do that, one of the two prisoners made a break for it. Look at him go, with everyone none the wiser. Well, I suppose we should grab him and put him in our car. Since I put down the mines, I shouldn't have to worry about the fellas picking up the other prisoner, so I can take my time with this one. Either way, he's got some secrets to whisper into us. Already, he's not too promising of a lead, considering he sounds like he has no idea what the hell those blue growths were. Although he does have a theory as to what the deal was with putting earbuds in their throats. Perhaps it wasn't a treatment for whatever this is, but rather, an amplifier. Whatever was transmitted into their lungs, or vocal cords or whatever, is what let the sickness develop in the body. Could they be trying to workshop this into a weapon? Little bit of biological warfare, Skullface? Feisty. It's a bit strange though. When I had Miller scan through the audio recordings they took from my microphone in that place, there was nothing similar about any of them. As I mentioned before, the ones I heard were playing different languages, and the audio they were playing was nothing special. Just news broadcasts and TV shows with no underlying theme to link them together. In related news, this guy escaped without the other prisoner because he believes she has the disease. Apparently her protective suit ripped at one point, so he's convinced that she's screwed anyway. Hmm. Does this change things? Should I go back and get the other one if she's a potential risk? Well, against my better judgment, I will. Oh, what? There was a second vehicle coming? God damn it, I didn't take D Walker or D Horse. I can't keep up with this. Well, when you shoot vehicles, they always stop and inspect the area for who the hell did that. So that's probably my best bet. That's not my best bet. Nah, if I don't save her now, they're gonna kill her. Maybe she has the disease, but she also might have the answers we need. Alright, if it'll shut the damn trumpet up! 
You need to help her. We're potentially saving thousands here. We can't let any potential lead die. For the time being, though, we don't get much out of her. We know that she's been working on this thing for five years with no real results, but that doesn't mean she won't be of assistance. As for if she herself has it, probably not. She insists her protective gear was always intact and she shows no symptoms. It's really her word against his, but my judgment is that I've seen what that disease does to people. And her? She ain't rocking the look. That's all there is to this mission. The side objectives are on the lamer side. Extract some funny flowers, some silly sheep, some brainless birds, and some crazy cars, and lead me nowhere. And considering that I am made for that, I'll give to the mission's credit that the stealth is pretty satisfying. I'm tempted to say that this is another nothing mission, but maybe that would be too harsh. It's alright. The male researcher added to cause that none of the audio that was being forced into those poor bastards over there was in English. All separate languages, but none of them the most spoken one. That's a strange exception. For the time being, we should have them separate from the rest, in case they do have the disease. We set up a quarantine platform just in case, and they seem like perfect fits for the first guests. Speaking of guests... Stop this! Now! If I can stop a knife attack in my dreams, I could stop one in real life. Turns out what I said earlier about her being able to kill me was wrong. Downright bodied. Tough luck. But anyway, what's the deal here? Why would you attack someone at random after all this time? Down to the result of any grudge. Hmm. Doesn't matter, I guess. Attempted murder isn't full murder in my book. She's exonerated. Let's go straight into the next mission. This is coming from that same general from Blood Runs Deep. The one with the child soldiers and the platoon leader or whatever. And this one also involves child soldiers. You see, another band of them have come up, similar to Eli's group. Going around, picking on the shitty adults. They've even kidnapped the general's own brother. Naturally, he isn't pleased with this development. He had always hoped his brother would meet his fate via alligators, not children with AKs. He wants us to find and rescue the poor little fella. But on top of that, extract the commander of those wannabes to stop them from moving forward. Problem is, this guy's withheld information about a job once already. Chances are this brother of his is actually a ghost or a goblin or something. We'll just have to go and see for ourselves. Once again, this is a mission with little meat on its bones. You see the child commander as soon as you enter the village, and the general's brother is also within sight. Ocelot recommends that you scout the place from a high vantage point, but there's really no need. It's all immediately visible to you. The only really interesting thing about the mission is that the general's brother is too injured to be faulted, so you have to carry him to the chopper along with the commander. Meaning you get to listen to him spill the tea that not only is this guy not the general's brother, but the general is actually dead, and this guy killed him. The sick bastard made this poor guy kill his own parents, so it was an act of revenge. He fought on their side to gain the general's trust, only to use these kids to attack him when his guard was down and then take him out. He's even still got his head. Damn, that's pretty hardcore. So it seems the general's real brother is the one who hired us, fooling us into believing we were saving him, when actually they want to torture this guy for taking down their leader. Well, I'd argue that the general's death isn't really that much of a loss. Keep in mind, this was the same guy that used child soldiers and wanted us to kill a few of them to keep them from blabbing. You know what? I I'd say we should defy him again, even if we're defying a tombstone this time. That was some top-notch revenge, and I can't think of a better reason than that to make you a diamond dog. But aside from that, that whole story, the mission's pretty whatever. There's yet another side objective for Fultoning all the children in the mission area, but your reward for beating the mission is the Fulton upgrade for kids, so this is really no biggie now. And there's another prisoner who's in the process of escaping that you can rescue, but if you take too long, he gets killed by either a child soldier or wild dogs. And that's it. I'm getting a bit worried that this will become a trend. Doubtful we'll get paid from the General's brother, or any more work from them after going against their requests twice now. But that's alright, we don't need their spotty record to dirty hours. Besides, we've got bigger problems to worry about. Boss, we have an emergency. Many of our staff are falling ill. Oh no. Oh, ah, ah, ah. Boss, do you remember seeing these symptoms before? Yes, Ocelot, I remember seeing these fucking symptoms. Shut up, man. Shit, shit, why didn't we take more precautions? This lines up perfectly with our mystery disease. And getting a closer look, we can see now that this is a parasitic infection. Microscopic worms were found laying eggs in the growths. Yucky. We can rule out that it was those researchers we just rescued that caused this. It wouldn't have spread this fast. Must have been someone else. 
Well, whatever spread this, we need to stop it from spreading ASAP. A good number of us have died already, and I won't be a monster that lets this keep going. But even with live patients to look at, we've got no room for hypothesis. I'll just have to take a guess and pray that I'm right. Well, what usually causes disease? Spread of germs. Looking through the staff at Mother Base, we can see that quite a number of them have a record of being unsanitary. That's a pretty safe bet, let's put them in quarantine. And maybe fire them later on, that's not a good look for us. And while we always take care to have our medical workers properly protected from germs, we don't know what we're dealing with. Maybe our protection wasn't good enough for whatever's attacking us. Quiet. I'm trying to focus here, can you please stop staring at me like that? We'll put them in quarantine too. That shouldn't be too bad, they'll get to work more on treating the sick. And that's, uh, all I got. I don't have anything substantial to work with. I mean, there's the earbuds potentially speeding the process along, but I have no idea how that works. Let's just wait and see if cases decrease from separating those guys. In the meantime, there's other ways I can help. With people sick and dying on Mother Base, morale is lowering pretty rapidly. They need me there to boost spirits. But I'm kinda afraid I'll catch something if I hang around there right now. I think I'll keep my distance. But I really should do something to help the situation. Um... Hey guys, it's me, Big Boss, here to say howdy. I'm just being safe and wearing a mask. You wouldn't want me being sick, would you? Also wearing my iconic sneaking suit, just so you know it's me. I've only worn it like two times, but it looks pretty good on me, doesn't it? I'm also wearing a glove over my bionic arm. Just doing it to feel normal, you know? I, I miss my arm a lot. See, to prove it's me, I'll kick your fucking ass. No one but Big Boss is allowed to do that to us. It feels pretty cathartic. Excuse me, guys, while I take my classic shower. This is Silent Mastodon reporting. The mission is going well so far. Absolutely no one suspects me. It's a good thing our voices are very similar. Hey, you know, just me, Big Boss, and the license I definitely have. All right, who just attempted to assassinate me? Okay, so while he's at that, I guess I'll just get back to missions as normal. Someone's gotta pay the bills around here. Also, this next one might just get us closer to solving the issue. Another PF official is hanging around our area of operations that might be of some importance. You see, he has a side gig of rounding people up and selling them. He's a human trafficker. And as human trafficking goes, his quote-unquote livestock ends up going wherever his buyer wants. But some poor souls ended up in, you guessed it, in Zoya Badiabulu. He's even the prick that captured Shabani. He willingly put a child into the arms of people who used him as a guinea pig. So why do we want him? Well, it's highly doubtful he'll have any info on what the cause of the disease is, considering he was just the supplier. But if we interrogate him, we could find out who we sold these people to. Working our way up the chain, we'll eventually find someone who we can get the information out of. Preferably Skullface, but we'll take anything we can get. Let's do this quick. Our good man is on the run, trying to escape the country to avoid facing justice for his crimes. We have to track him down and make sure he doesn't do that. But remember, he works with one of the PFs, so they ought to have an intel file on which way he's heading. While Quiet does her own scouting, I'll check this random village, it'll probably have something. This was the place we went through in that one mid-mission Footprints of Phantoms, the one with the walker gears. I remember that the top of the place at the far end was where the important stuff was, so checking there was obviously going to lead to an intel file. Now we have his exact route. He's making a pit stop at Gazeba Camp. That place is well guarded, so best we take care of him before he gets there. I actually had a hard time tracking the guy down. I went through his entire route according to the map and even scanned through the camp in case he already made it there, but there was no sign of him. Then it turned out that he had only just barely made it to the very beginning of the route and he was just taking a very long time to move, so that was cool. He has his own team of guards with him, so I should take care of them first. I'll use a decoy to draw them in. This is an upgraded version that makes extra noise. Here, listen. You're pretty good. You're pretty good. You see, he says the thing. For like, th the 20th time. This game fucking You're killed that good. line, man. It means nothing to me now. Alright, just you and me now. The pathetic man pleads for his life, saying he's got a family waiting for him. So did your victims, pal. Luckily for you, I need information. I'm gonna extract you and bring you back to base. Right? I mean, I should. He might have valuable things to say, but then he's gonna become one of us. Do I really want that? Is it really worth it? He's a scumbag. I don't want him walking around Mother Base. I don't even want to bring him in just to fire him. That makes it easier for him to flee to another country. Should I? Should I not? Okay, you know what? How about this? I'm gonna scan you and see if you're any good. One of your stats, buddy. Hmm. A plus and a troublemaker. Harassment. That's not good. Sorry, you don't meet my standards. Target confirmed dead. Your 
Objectives complete. We'll figure something out. We don't need him. The only side objective worth noting is that there are four prisoners in that village we got the intel file from. Not because it's interesting or anything, but because I think it's very irresponsible to be bringing new people in unless it's absolutely necessary. Well, actually, I guess it's better this than for them to be tortured and killed, so never mind. We'll just put them straight into quarantine. On the plus side, one of them had a unique ability that's very much worth mentioning. He unlocks a new upgrade for D-Walker. A new head, specifically. The previous one is what gave it the ability to use stealth camo. Unfortunately, putting a new head on removes the ability that the last one had. But I wouldn't worry about that because this new one gives you search mode. What does search mode do? Well, I'm glad you asked. While being close enough to a base, you can have it scan the area and mark everyone inside it. That's not a new thing, of course, but I would like you to keep in mind that not only is this thing the fastest way to traverse the maps, not only is it a weapon of mass destruction with three guns attached to it, not only can you somehow use stealth with it, not only can you use CQC with it, but now it has the best feature of two other buddies. And here's the kicker, it does it the best out of them. DD can't fully mark, but D Walker can. Quiet takes a good bit to scout an area and she leaves out people in buildings, but D Walker is the quickest and does mark people in buildings. Trading this off for stealth camo is a fantastic deal, but I must again say, we're not done. Because basically, right after you develop the surveillance head, you unlock the final one, the auto-intercept head. You, you wanna know what this one does? <laughs> it fights for you! That's right, that was basically the second main thing Quiet had going for her, but this robot can also do that. D did they playtest this? Did they not realize how insanely OP D-Walker was? I honestly think they did know, but thought, ah, fuck it, it's too fun to nerf. And God bless them for that, I love this thing so much. I will say though, auto-intercept is pretty limited. It could only use the guns in its torso, not the side-mounted one or the arm. It also can't move on its own, so it's more like your own personal gun emplacement. I think search is the better ability, but this is still ridiculous. Because keep in mind that you have a good selection of torso guns you can use. And if you want to change from one head to another, you can just have it changed to a different loadout in the field. It's fair to say that D Walker's head game is out of this world. And there you have it. That's why this Swiss army knife of a buddy is the best of them. DD and Quiet aren't obsolete. Quiet is the better defender by a good margin, and DD is situationally a better marker, mainly for bases that are larger than its search range. But overall, it's outclassed them. This is the best thing Huey's ever made, including Hal. Taking another look at how things are doing, cases of the disease have unsurprisingly not dropped. So it's not a general spread of germs issue, but what is it? <sighs> this is giving me another headache. I need to think of something before it's too late. We've already had one mother base get torn apart thanks to XOF. Now they're doing it all over again. But thankfully, finally, it seems that we have a solid lead. One of our intel team members seems to have found something. Something that can actually put an end to this. But bad news, he got captured by the enemy- How many times is this gonna happen? The intel team can't go three seconds without getting their asses captured. I'm starting to think it's a kink, Kojima. Ugh. Alright, it's our only hope now. Don't you die on me, soldier. I'm coming to save you. Spoilers, this is absolutely another nothing mission, so I'm just gonna speed through it. The village where he's being held is right next to our drop-off point, and there are two soldiers willing to give up where he is right where you enter from. Either that or use search mode to immediately find him. It's a straight shot to the guy minus a few guards you have to trank, but no. What's this? He escaped. He takes the truck and drives right out of there. I sprinted to try and keep up with him, but for some inexplicable reason, he starts driving toward a cliff and then just jumps out? Not sure what that's about. Well, if you didn't get captured in the first place and do whatever the hell that was, I'd be very impressed with you right now. Let's just get you out of here and talking. Mission complete. Only side objective is to extract him before he gets in the truck. Extremely short and bad mission. See me after class. Good work as always, boss. I couldn't help but notice that you missed a few material crates that were in the guard post, though. There was a yellow one with a water droplet marked on it. I believe that means that it's urine. It could prove useful to us, and uh, yeah, you know what, screw this, I'm done asking nicely, boss, get me my piss box right fucking now. You're not gonna believe this shit, he fucking died on his way back. You've gotta be kidding me. <sighs> it's not the end of the world, though, because he did say something vital before he went. He figured out that there's someone who knows the disease more than anyone else. Someone who can cure it. His name is apparently Code Talker, and the intel we got gave us his exact location. There's a mansion at the top of the map that I haven't been to yet. And that's where he is. Perfect, we finally have a strong lead. But, there's one last thing that's bugging me. 
Apparently this man is very old, which gives us an idea of who that guy they were talking about back in that one mission was. But, as you're probably aware, elderly people die the easiest from disease. If we bring this guy to Mother Base, he could die before being able to really help. And then we'd have nothing. No choice but to wait for the disease to take us. We can't have that. We should quarantine everyone who's sick first. But I can't do that without knowing who's sick. It's time I really did some deep thinking. I could figure it out. I mean, I'm a smart guy. I can deduce and analyze. Have you seen how long my videos are? Do you know who you're dealing with? My mind's always clearest when I'm in the field doing my thing. So, let's do it there. Okay, so, what is everything we know? These blue growths are either caused or amplified by the audio being transmitted to the host through those earbuds. Let's assume amplified. I have no idea how that works, so I'll put it to the side for now. Maybe the fact that kids aren't affected by it could give us a clue. If the host's body is too young, the parasite doesn't really function. Could it be age that does it? Maybe when the body ages, there's some sort of maturation in the cells that can be exploited to infect the body. Kind of like a reverse version of chickenpox, but way worse. Nah, that wouldn't really make sense. Adults can get that too. It's just known as frequent. I don't think there's a disease that only targets certain age groups. There are ones that are a lot more common in certain groups, but not any that are exclusive to them. Besides, Shibani was slightly infected, and he wasn't a young child or an adult. He was in between. So that rules that out. The cause has to be related to the earbuds. But how in the hell? Audio attracting parasites? That's unheard of, pardon the pun. And either way, I have no solid proof of this. But for the sake of going down every possible avenue, I have to consider it. I mean, this is a Kojima project. It could be something something absurd like that. Maybe it's the subject matter of the audio. Something happening in other countries, you know, current events. I mean, that's the only reason I can think of that none of it was in English. Well, as I said, there was nothing really connecting each tape together. It's a war after all. I'm not a monster. It's a war after all. <sighs> Back in the helicopter, I'm getting distracted. Okay, so let, let's think, let's think even more. Looking at all the people quarantined, I can't find anything to link them together. And they don't really talk about much that would involve current events. All I've ever heard was them discussing my history because they're obsessed with me, or like, wanting to touch Dee Dee's paw pads, which is... weird. Maybe let's not focus on those that are affected, but those that aren't. Maybe that could help. I'm trying to think, who would be immune to this based on any audio-related stuff? You know, maybe someone around here has a speech impediment, or maybe someone can't speak at all. But, I mean, who in Diamond Dogs would have such a specific disability? Oh yeah, I completely forgot! That guy from Where Do The Bees Sleep? You remembered, there was a prisoner who helped us find that sniper rifle and he couldn't speak. He's still with us, he goes by Silent Basilisk, no relation to Mastodon. And what do you know? He's not affected, he shows no symptoms. Okay, that's some proof. But that's only one guy. That's not really enough. We need more proof that speech is related to it. Quiet. People are dying and I'm trying to figure out why. Would you please stop eye-fucking me when Pequod is right there? Oh, quiet, that's right. You don't speak and you're not affected either. Kaz thinks otherwise, in fact, he thinks that she's spreading it. I don't see why that would be the case, he's just looking for a reason to kill her. But she could know something. Now that I think about it, that would explain why she attacked that guy earlier. Looking at the staff logs, he's dead from the disease now. Maybe he was the first guy carrying it, and she was trying to stop it from spreading. Either way, we have two people who are mute and seemingly immune as a result. There's still reasonable doubt, but out of desperation, let's confirm that the cause is definitely audio-related. We're deducing here, we're making progress. But we still need to know what it is that's audio-related. If it's not subject matter, what else could it be? Inflections? No, that couldn't be it. With all the languages being spoken there, there can't be one inflection being used between them. Wait. With all the languages being spoken... Languages? They were cultivating symptoms by playing different languages in each of their throats and seeing how the parasite responded to each one. It didn't matter what the subject was as long as it was spoken in a certain language. English wasn't used because it was already ruled out. Okay, it's language. We have our culprit. But which language is doing it? Go back to the staff menu, not the quarantine menu. I put most of those people there. Let's look at who died from it. Look at the language tab I didn't understand the reason for until now. See a common denominator? They mostly had a bunch that they spoke, but one between them all. The language Kikongo attracts the parasite. Whew, okay, that was a lot of breath that I wasted. Let's put that theory to the test. Everyone who speaks Kikongo goes in quarantine. I just have to select all of them and put them in there. Oh wow, that's a lot of people. I'll, uh, be right back. Alright, we'll quarantine the 
staff you specified. Incredible loss. Thanks to you, the number of new victims has plummeted. And the common point between the infected. Is it really possible for a disease to spread because of that? I guess so, man. I did it. I figured it out. I'm like... A billionaire in my brain. Well, now that the place is nice and tidy, let's go get this code talker fellow. See if we can get this sorted out. Although we do have some downtime before that, so there's a tape I've been putting off listening to until now. It's about Eli. We haven't heard him talk much, but Eli has a British accent. Not yet, Snake. It's not over yet. On top of the skin tone, that really makes him unique from the others. Why does he talk wrong? Kaz was looking into it and figured something interesting out. In case you don't know your Metal Gear lore too well, when Zero and Co. were fleshing out their plans for Cypher, they wanted to have capable soldiers worthy of defending them. And who else could make a good soldier but the best soldier? So if he passed on his genes to the next generation if he catch my drift, he'll spawn some strong guys. They figured Big Boss wouldn't be for this idea, so they had to do it in secret. Zero, like, jerked him off in a sleep or something and got a good sample of his DNA. They then fertilized an egg, in this case Eva's, to bring this weird-ass project to fruition, and that's how the miracle of life happens. This project would then come to be known as Les Enfants Terribles, the Terrible Children. A name like that, they just asked for it to be cursed. I don't know why the fuck they named it that. There were a few duds, but three made it out of the womb. The ones we would come to know as Liquid, Solidus, and of course, Solid Snake. Once Big Boss figured out what happened, it was the straw that broke the camel's back. He left Zero and promptly formed Militaire Sans Frontières, giving it a French name to spite the project. Now, why am I bringing this up? Well, the part of the project where they raised the children up to be super soldiers was abandoned over time. They dispersed each child to different parts of the world to live out their shorter-than-average lives. Liquid Snake in specific was sent to England. Being raised there would naturally give you an accent, wouldn't you think? So, could Eli be... my son? Well, we can't say for sure yet. If Eli was living in England, how did he end up in Central Africa leading a group of troublemakers to fuck shit up? We would ask him, but he is a stubborn boy. Any attempt at reasoning with him ends with some sort of physical altercation. He wouldn't tell us a damn thing at knife point. Not that we tried that, I would never allow that. Somehow, they're gonna get a DNA test done on him to see if he's a match with mine. I just hope they don't hurt him. Injections and stuff can be scary for kids, just be careful, okay? And to squeeze one last thing in before the mission, I'll grade the last four. I don't have much else to say about them, they weren't great. So I'll make this a speed round. Close contact was alright, simple premise of rescuing two prisoners with an interesting plot development squeezed in. Unfortunately, the side objectives were not very good, C tier. Aim true ye vengeful was a touch worse, far too simple and bare bones for its own good, once again only being redeemed by what the prisoner had to say, D tier. Hunting down was fine enough, finding the PF official was an interesting experience. We haven't had many times where we see a specific trail that we have to search through and that's cool. Side objectives, no, B tier. Root cause is probably my new least favorite, to the point where it's making me rethink my score for Footprints of Phantoms. There's so little to it that I don't have anything to say except E. Yeah, it's unfortunate. The missions have taken a bit of a dive. The last few batches were at least solid at most great, but this one's pretty flimsy. However, I think we're getting close to the end, so it's fair to say that KJP probably saved a lot of their good stuff for last. My expectations are high. Will you deliver? Much like with Hellbound, the Huey mission, I have to enter this one on foot. This mansion is located deep within the jungle, so it's only natural to set the mood by walking through it. If you remember though, there were rumors of people walking into this place and not making it out. Which makes the fact that everything is so calm around here very strange. Although, once you do make it a few dozen meters, a familiar mist comes in. Alright, fair enough. Bring on those machete-wielding dweebs, I could take them. Oh, but wait just one minute. These aren't the big ones. They aren't even the small ones. Lady Skulls that specialize in sniping. You heard that right, they mass-produced Quiet. And all four of them aren't gonna let me see Code Talker without a fight. Now, when you see four Quiets, you might think that my criticisms of her fight are about to be quelled. Well, not really, but I still think I might prefer this. That's mainly because they're a lot different than they seem just from looking at them. Quiet's fight was the end part two. An open area, she attacks at all angles, cat and mouse. This is a more unique spin on the sniper duel. As opposed to cat and mouse, it's more like cat and whack-a-mole, and the goal is equally to push through them as it is to beat them. There hasn't been a Skulls encounter that you couldn't escape from, and this is no different. If you just make it to the end of the jungle, they leave you be, they don't get paid enough to deal with that. But if you're not a bitch, then fighting them is good enough fun. Each
Witch Skull is a dumbed down version of Quiet with less health and easier to spot. No offense, ladies. But the fact that they work together gives them the ability to do something that even the end couldn't overwhelm you. No matter what situation you're in, if you have two laser sights trained on you, you're gonna panic. But if you didn't get familiar with your surroundings, you probably just landed on a flat plane and made yourself an easier target. One thing I didn't mention about Quiet's battle was that if you hit her while being within close proximity, she leaps away and drops a grenade at your feet. Mary-Kate, Ashley, Elizabeth, and the secret unlockable one can also do that, meaning it's probably gonna happen a lot more often. And when it does, it of course encourages you to move away, putting you in the open. There were a lot of moments in the fight where they had me stuck in a really specific spot that I couldn't move an inch from and made me use my head to figure a way out of it. In this case, it was decoys. If they really get you in their sights, they might just go in for a physical attack. They've got machetes too, it's just not their main weapon. And unlike the other variants where they're using it pretty often, these ones don't use it enough to let you get the counter timing down. It's not too bad though, because it's rare that they'll use it anyway. And with all of them knocked out, we have a clear path to our destination. Hmm. You know, that whole thing reminds me. I should have Quiet dropped in here, shouldn't I? Provide cover from the outside and whatnot. Ugh, look at me. I'm a mess. Well, as long as the sight of a guy with blood on his face doesn't give the old man a heart attack, we should be okay. Whoa, look at this place. That's a nice pad you've stolen there. For whatever reason, Quiet can't scout the location right now, so it's up to me to know where the enemies are. And this is especially difficult because they heard the commotion over in the jungle. This puts them in caution mode automatically, which puts me in discomfort mode automatically. More than ever before, I need to make sure there's no room for failure. If anything goes wrong, Code Talker could be taken away or even killed, leaving us with nothing. As this is a pretty big place, there are multiple entrances. One at the front, two at the back, and a few on the sides. Whichever way you go, the inside is luckily not very crowded. There's some comms equipment inside as well. If you think a long way back, you'll remember that if you destroy this stuff, they can't get back up in case things get hairy. But destroying it would definitely make noise with explosives or bullets. It would be really useful to take this out, but how? Wait, that's right, I always keep a water pistol on me! Billionaire brain in action. While I was searching the place for the old coot, I had a couple of close calls with a few guards inside. Once in particular, I hid in the box just barely in time for them to miss me. That was tense as fucking hell. I'm seeing that in certain spots there are candles laid around, so I'll take them as clues as to which way to go. And eventually, there's a door with two on each side leading to the basement. I think this is it. Anyone home around here? I've been waiting, Tilly. Or should I say, Bedahokale? You fit the description. You must be Code Talker. So, listen, pal, I have some people at my place who are suffering from a disease that I've heard you can fix, so are you gonna be able to- Silence. Or death. This contains an herb that they dislike. <laughs> Good. That should deafen them for a while. All right, friend, thanks for the fat boof. From him, we finally get a solid explanation on what this thing is. It's known as the vocal cord parasite. The way it functions is that the parasite works its way down the throat and attaches itself to the vocal cords. When certain types of sound are triggered from the vocal cords, it allows them to breed and feast on the host's insides until they die. And from there, they can explore. It's viral through droplets. When the host coughs, the parasite can travel to another host, and the cycle continues from there. Truth is, most people on Mother Base are probably infected, but since most of them don't trigger the sounds that the parasite likes, in this case Kakongo, they're safe and the parasite will die out in them. But they still make excellent carriers for those that do speak it. Here's the part that might surprise you though. Kikongo isn't the only strain of the virus. They were cultivating multiple different strains of it at the Devil's House, not just one. We don't know how many there are, but it's likely that there are versions for all five major languages outside of English. Is Skullface trying to wipe out certain languages as a form of genocide? No way to tell if that's what he's going for specifically, but either way, we've found it. The weapon to surpass Middle Gear but one thing at a time. Code Talker says that once the virus has reached a certain stage in the body, there's no saving it. Best to put the infected down at that point. But if they're still in earlier stages, he can cure them. And he's fully willing to. He was taken against his will by Skullface to develop this virus to the point of it being a threat to the world. He doesn't want to let that happen any more than we do. It's fair to say, 
Welcome to Diamond Dogs, Goat Dogger. Now all we have to do is get him to the chopper and head back to Mother Base double time. However, there's a problem. A group of the PFs has completed their search of the jungle and confirmed that there was a struggle and someone took out the skulls there. They consider whoever can do that to be a major threat, so they're treating it accordingly. Reinforcements. Lots and lots of reinforcements. But I thought I destroyed the comms equipment. They must have called it in before I did that. There are extra soldiers coming in with better equipment, a helicopter flying around, and through my scope's microphone, I can hear an armored vehicle. The only good place I can have Pequod meet us is right through this stream of backup. And sneaking through them like this is impossible. I mean, I can try going through the trees and hoping they won't see me, but is it worth the risk? If Code Talker gets shot once, it's over. Not only will Mother Base be screwed, but his help might be valuable to the rest of the world too. I have to kill them. I don't have a choice. I'm doing this for a good cause. It's worth a few lost lives. Oh, to hell with it. What's the point of putting this facade up any longer? I could sneak past them if I wanted to, but I don't. I've held myself back for too long now, and it's getting annoying. Look at me, covered in blood. Why does it matter whose it is? Trying to be a good person? What a load of shit. You can't become a force to be reckoned with without being feared in the first place. Sneaking through every situation and being careful to always use non-lethal methods makes diamond dogs look pathetic. I already do good things. I save animals, I save prisoners, I take child soldiers out of the battlefield and give them a good education outside of how to fight. I made sure to figure out the cause of the virus so I could save as many people as possible. So what if a few people die along the way? Nothing I haven't done before. I just thought that this time around, I could try and be something else. Something more passive and friendly. But what has that lifestyle taken away from me? I don't speak to people much anymore, I just listen and do what people tell me to do. In every cassette tape, I don't speak even though I am there when it's being recorded. Maybe I am the main character by literal definition, but sometimes it feels like Ocelot and Kaz are instead, and they aren't even on screen for most of the game. No, I'm done being this way. Being a phantom of my former self, always operating with some silly crutch I've imposed, a melody always beckoning me to do what I wanted to do anyway, that ends now. And if being myself makes me a monster, so be it. Huh. Would you look at that? The trumpet's gone. Kaz, drop my emergency loadout. I'm gonna need it. Let's do this. Felt good. Liberating. Big Boss is back. I shouldn't have to feel bad anyway. It's a game, after all. Oh, right. Code Talker. With everyone dealt with, we can leave safely. With some time before we get back, he can explain a bit more about this cure. It's actually a different type of parasite, known as Wolbachia. Once injected into the body, the Wolbachia targets the parasite and turns all the males into females, stopping them from reproducing. It's pretty difficult to explain, but to put it as simply as possible, it stops the parasite from laying eggs, leading to them all dying out. It does come at a price, though. The Wolbachia that gets injected into your body is still a parasite, and it renders those who have it infertile for life. None of your genes can be passed to the next generation. That's a shame for some of the soldiers, but it's a price worth paying to be saved from a terrible fate. As a side note, sometimes the vocal cord parasite can be used to strengthen the host. For instance, a certain sniper that operated in Selinoyarsk was found to have been a host for them, but his body took them differently, granting him strange powers. 
I'm not sure why he specifically was given a justification for his abilities and not the fear who can climb trees super fast and jump absurd distances, or the sorrow who is a ghost, or the pain who can control all bees, but whatever gets you hard. Skullface somehow was able to see how that worked in his body and took a sample of it. Eventually, he optimized them and gave it to a group of his soldiers, granting them insane speed and strength, as well as other fun abilities like hardening your skin with rocks and making mist happen. So yeah, that's what the skulls are. Fucked up XOF soldiers. Guess that's how Quiet has her powers too. After that whole explanation, Code Talker asks a very strange question. That being, if we've seen an XOF vehicle before. And yeah, we have. The one with the yellow cake in it. Why? What became of it? The metallic archaea. The what now? Bombs ahead! It's them. Who, the skulls? No, th this mist is different. It's brown. What the hell? Is it aging the helicopter? Why is it rusting so quick? Ah, shit, we're going down. Brace yourselves! Ah, uh, fuck that hurt. Have I been out long? Everyone alright? Good. Code Talker's alive. We have to get out of here now. Call a backup chopper. I know you've been asking for a new one, so lucky day for you, Pequod. Pequod? You awake? Oh no. Oh no, 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 no. Stay with me, soldier. Hang on. You're gonna make it. Pequod. Do I even need to go over what happened next? It was the skulls using some newer ability I didn't know about. I had to fight them to clear the mist. YouTube probably wouldn't let me show you what I did to them in my blind rage, so let's just say they didn't get to run off this time. Now that I know that they're human, it made me feel better knowing that they have sentience and can feel every bullet. Once I was satisfied, I called in a backup chopper and put Code Talker in there. We won. We made it out of there alive. But Pequot, he... He only just told me about his wife that he hated. Over the next two days, Code Talker was able to prove himself to us pretty quickly. He converted the Wolbachia into a vaccine that we used on everyone who wasn't too far gone. It worked almost instantly, bringing the sick back to their feet and ready to work once again. The quarantine platform that was getting overcrowded just a few days ago became empty. It was a resounding success, and the vocal cord parasite was no longer a threat to diamond dogs. But we can't forget how many lives it took to make this happen. In total, 437 soldiers died from the infection. It shouldn't have even got to 10. All of this is thanks to him, Skullface. He's taken so much from us. Limbs, soldiers, friends, trusted companions. They meant nothing to him, all fuel for his greater goal, whatever it may be. It's irrelevant. No matter what, we'll put a stop to it. Kill him. The only thing left to do is to find where he set up shop. We don't know where he is, but there's someone in our ranks who might. I gave Huey a small benefit of the doubt for a while now, but I'm willing to test that. The thing that took down our helicopter back there was Metallic Archaea. It was a separate thing Code Talker worked on. It's also pretty complicated, so I'll just say that there's a version of it that corrodes metals. Both the Skulls and Sahalanthropus are able to use that as a weapon. And so are we. He whipped up some for us to put into a syringe that we threatened Huey with. If even a drop of it hits his exo-legs, they're done. Greenlit that torture method myself. Figured he would be afraid of us destroying Sahalanthropus so he wouldn't tell us where it was moved. But the one thing he'd fear even more was losing his legs again. And I was right. It's back in Afghanistan, in the only part of the map I haven't explored yet. A Soviet base known as OKB-0. So that's it then. If that's where Skullface is, that's where our final battle will be. So I put the intel team in charge of watching over that place until we see some movement from XOF there. The second we do, I strike. Until then though, I have to wait. This is it. The final part of the game. So it's time that we get any side stuff worth noting out of the way. There's only a few things that I really have to do. When it comes to side ops, it's just side ops. There's no grand finale to them, they just stop happening after a while. Leaving the ones we finish to be recycled forever. But in a way, it's still a shame to see them go. I got the last round of old MSF survivors as well as the old photos they had on them. But when I bring them to pass, nothing. 
It doesn't matter how much I remind her of the past, she doesn't recognize that we're not there anymore. She's stuck in a brain that isn't her own. But is that really a bad thing? Is it wrong that she doesn't remember who she really was? Her role as a spy, her conflicting feelings about us, her fight with Big Boss, what happened to her at Camp Omega? Does she need to know these things? Or can she remain as the innocent girl we've come to like from Peace Walker? What if we told her that all the ones who died just left? You know, Galvez went back to teaching, Amanda and Chico had a revolution to fight, etc. I think that that's an okay future for her. I mean, look what knowing what happened nine years ago did to Kaz. It turned him into a hateful, kind of obnoxious person. Does she need to be that? I don't think so. Let her be happy with an occasional headache here and there. I survived throughout the process of making this video with that problem. I'm sure she can live like that. So, I think I give up. Pacifica Ocean is dead, and Poss isn't herself anymore. She doesn't need to be. One last thing before we finish this fight. They managed to get a DNA test done on Eli while he wasn't paying attention and compared it to mine. The results are in now, and unsurprisingly, we were a 0% match. Wait, 0%? Not even a lousy decimal point? That's... weird. But he's a perfect fit. His age, his accent, his appearance all line up with being Liquid Snake. The helicopter even stopped talking after he showed up. He has to be my son. Well, apparently the type of test they conducted isn't official, so maybe it's off or something. I think Eli has the suspicion that we're related too. Whenever he gets aggressive, which is all the fucking time, he always talks about killing me and only me. He has a grudge against me specifically. And using the future as a reference, Liquid felt the same exact way. Even talking about how he used to live under me like he's doing now. He hates the idea of being a clone, especially of a man that he despises. And I guess I could understand. He was bred for war and war alone and suffers with that knowledge all the time. I know I would hate that. I'm gonna have to assume that the test was wrong for now. Until stronger evidence comes out, that's my boy and you can't change that. No, with that stuff out of the way, it's time we moved on for the last time. We just got word from the intel team. XOF is making moves, big ones. They've released the Russian and Pashto strands of the vocal cord parasite in Afghanistan. All of the Soviets and Mujahideen in the area are dead. Skullface is planning something, and he wants us to see what it is. He's practically calling us over with a move like that. Hm. Well, let's give him what he wants. I'm heading over there straight away. But not just me. Kaz, Ocelot, Quiet, D-Horse, DD, Huey, and Silent Mastodon are all coming with. No one's gonna miss this. Are you ready? This is the end, and we're gonna see it through. Pequon 2 is doing a good job for his first real day in the field. It's unfair to compare him to what came before, but it's hard to not let that thought intrude. Another helicopter is following close behind with everyone else, including Eli, weirdly enough. He snuck on at the last second, so it's too late to bring him back. Whatever, as long as he stays out of our way and stays away from danger. And if he gets thirsty, there's some juice boxes under the back seat. Are you getting all this, Cos? Chances are, Skullface is gonna unleash the Holanthropus into Afghanistan and fire off a nuke or two. That would be phase one of his genocide plan. We need to stop that ASAP. As I've said, this is the last part of either map that I haven't been to, so I have to drop in outside and make my way there. There's no resistance that I have to face. Any that would be there are dead, burnt, and buried. It's a shame. I was hoping I could do one last round of a new breed of stealth, but it just wasn't meant to be. At least I could still take one final ride on D-Horse. On the way there, Huey tells us that he's made up his mind on supporting us fully again. He doesn't want to be a pawn of Skullface anymore, and he'll do whatever he can to pay off his debt. Good for him, but forgive me if I have a hard time trusting the guy. I'll believe it when I see it. Alright, this is OKB0. OK the largest base in the game, at least horizontally. And at the moment, the most well guarded. As a result, it's probably the most difficult base to sneak through as well. But after everything we've been through, we can handle it. I'll swap to Didi to make this an easier process. Farewell, D-Horse. I will never use you again. 
Even approaching the entrance is tricky. There's a sniper watching over the dirt road and mines littered throughout the sides. Not to mention the walker gear with its headlights on. If you're not careful, they could end your stealth approach before it even starts. Once you've made it past the outer layer, there's a power generator you can switch off to limit their visibility, which will let you get through the gate. You could do that or use this hidden ladder to sneak around on the other side. It doesn't get any easier after this. Section 1 is even more of a pain. Multiple spotlights are on, scanning through the area on top of two more snipers waiting to pick you off. There's a tank sitting there unpiloted. I suppose it's a reminder of what'll happen if we fuck up and get caught. Something important you should keep note of is to try and avoid going in any light sources when possible. This place is crawling with goons, so there are a ton of places to be seen from. Thankfully, there's another power generator to help with that here and for every other part moving forward. Section 2 is when it really starts to get tricky. This area is where the enemy gunship gets involved. A moving searchlight on top of the pre-existing one here is real fun, I promise. On top of that, we also start seeing surveillance cameras here. I think there was only a single camera in one mission before this, so this is basically the introduction to them. Unless you want to count Ground Zeroes, I guess. Either way, interesting place to bring them back. If you shoot them, someone will go to investigate, which will eventually put them on caution mode. So, best you just avoid them altogether. There are a few buildings at this point that you can cut through as a shortcut. If you can evade the cameras, then this is the way to go. But if not, then there's nothing wrong with the old standby. Just be careful of the walker gears. Section 3, the final one, is thankfully the shortest. There's yet another searchlight, but that's really the biggest threat. The best way to go is to climb up the wall to the left of the gate, throw a magazine to distract the only guy up there, and sneak past. From there, we have another walker gear, but it's stationary. You can just walk right past him. And with all that out of the way, we've reached the end. Up these stairs is our target. There's no going back once I'm up there. And now that everyone in the base is marked, no one can escape. Okay. <coughs> <clears throat> I see Skullface's helicopter coming in. I should get moving now. Don't want to scare the poor fucker off at this point. Let's get quiet in on this. Have a shot on him lined up in case things go sour. Moment of truth. Come on, you son of a bitch. You two have known loss. And that loss torments you still. You hope hatred my someday uh, What are you doing? Stop that, you're making me nauseous. He gives his typical introduction spiel about phantoms and demons, but what I want to know is why. Why is he going through all this trouble to put the world into chaos? It's probably a poor decision to make, but I think I'll follow him for a while and see what he says. No doubt he wants to talk about his plans. Besides, Sahalanthropus is clearly not here. Well, where to begin? How about 20 years ago? He and XOF had been there since our story began. Virtuous mission, Operation Snake Eater, him and his crew were always there to make sure our messes were cleaned up. 
keeping track of our status, providing assistance, all from the shadows. That was XOF's original purpose, insurance for the unlikely scenario that we fuck up. But when things went sour, when Big Boss left and Fox disbanded, that all changed. Zero went to them and offered them a new job in Cypher, his private strike force. Skullface in particular became a trusted ally to Zero, but the feeling was not mutual. Quite the opposite, he despised Zero and everything he stood for. And his thoughts are the same toward us. All of the series' problems have been caused by these two misinterpreting the will of the boss. She only wished for the world to be at peace, united. Somehow, Zero thought that this meant putting the world under perfect control so that everyone does exactly what he wants. All he needs is a piece of Eden and he's set. But strangely enough, I think this is a brilliant interpretation of the boss's will compared to Snake's. Outer heaven is the answer. The world can only know peace in war. It's our natural state, the only thing that unites all humans. Oh, there's nothing quite like a bullet in the brain to remind me of how free I am in this world. All the chaos that we'd soon experience as Solid Snake and Raiden was due to these two idiots bickering about what a dead woman who was pretty good at fighting wanted. And they were both wrong. Even someone as twisted as Skullface can see that. To backtrack a bit, Skullface was born in a Transylvanian village. Due to this being during a very turbulent period of history, it was quite familiar to being raided and conquered. First, it was the Germans who forced him to change his way of life, everything down to the very language he spoke. Then later, the Soviets came and did the same exact thing. His village would keep moving to different parts of Europe, each one having a new way of life in a different tongue. When you're forced to learn a different language in your upbringing, it can change you. Because the more you understand the people's words, the more you understand the people. And just as he grew acclimated to this new culture, he was ripped away and forced into yet another one. By the time he was an adult, Skullface was an amalgamation of different languages and cultures, while having completely forgotten the one he came from. Imagine trying to think about what your upbringing would have been like in a perfect world, but you can't because you no longer have anything to go on. Completely stripped of his own past, his own culture. Sure, he may be filled with knowledge about tons of other cultures, but that doesn't change the fact that the flesh of his village was burned away from him. That's the metaphorical reason that he looks that way. The real reason is that burning oil spilled on him as a kid, but that's not relevant, and he's certainly not the only person that this has happened to. Earlier, I said that there were five languages outside of English, but I'm sure most of you know that's plainly false. There are roughly 7,000 languages currently in the world. There are many small villages and communities that have their own tongue exclusive to them. And if that seems like a lot, studies have put the amount of languages in human history around the 30,000 mark. But over the centuries, that number has been cut down time and time again thanks to colonization. Thousands, if not millions of people have had their language ripped away from them along with their home, forced to speak the way that the people with the guns do. And along with that, they have to change their lifestyle. Those two changes very often go hand in hand. This has been a problem that's plagued humanity ever since we uttered our first words. But the UN only recognizes the six languages most spoken. They don't want to acknowledge how many skull faces there are. It was later on in life when he was working under Zero that he realized something. Cypher's goal is to unify the world by force. That exact philosophy is just what many world powers already have, only to a smaller extent and by different means. Zero's no different from the people who took his past away from him. So, what must be done is simple. Cypher must be destroyed. The code which Cypher plans to use for its world-conquering AI is in one language. English, the largest one in the world, although Mandarin Chinese is catching up. The most rational way to topple such a goliath is to cut off the source of its power. And that's where the vocal cord parasite comes in. Thus far, he's only used it in an attempt to remove annoyances. The Hamid, Malak's group, the Soviets, and Mujahideen just now, and us. But that's not its main purpose, far from it. The final strain of the virus, and the strongest one, is English. They weren't testing English at the Devil's House because they already had it. This is Skullface's plan. To cut down Cypher, cut down Zero. First, he'll kill us. Then, using Sahalanthropus, he launches a nuke. While the world and the AI are in a frenzy, maybe putting their fingers on their own big red buttons, he unleashes the parasite. Can't you see? This is what the boss wanted. Her true will being achieved not by her friend or her pupil, but Skullface. This is how it was meant to be. The true liberator, the true unification of the world. Peace will be achieved by destroying the English language. Jesus fucking Christ. You don't see any problems with your plan, Skullfuck? You don't think way too many people are gonna die? 
English takes up like a quarter of the population of the planet. You'd be killing nearly two billion people. That's even more than 9-11. Maybe you didn't think about this, but the AI doesn't have vocal cords, dumbass. You could still type words without being able to speak the language it's in. Also, now that we know there's a cure that can be made, we would have your little problem dealt with in maybe a few days. You know, I was kind of under the impression that he was gonna do the opposite. Wipe out every language except English. That lines up more with his ambitions. English is the language that's united the most people on the planet, so if you just make that the only language, then every everyone would be forced to speak it. Future generations wouldn't have to go through what you did. It didn't even have to be English, just any one language. I'm not saying that that's a great plan either, but this? What you're doing is further separating the people of the world by removing its greatest link of communication. Even by your stupid ass logic, that is not the boss's will. What? <laughs> Why do all the main villains in this series have to be so stupid? What she said was very simple, but you guys have taken it to such extremes that it's not even related anymore. Illuminati, War Always, and Goodbye English are what you got from- I wish the world would chill out, man, fuck. I swear to Christ, if her last words were, I need you to take care of my cat, Cobra Unit Commander the Fuzzy, you guys would each come up with something so radically unnecessary to the point where it's kind of impressive when all you have to do is fucking feed the thing. I don't even need to talk about the rest of his plan, it's just worse. Word soup. On those who bleach off the words of their fellow men. The parasite of genetic levels expanding. My control was as because you do is where the you is. This war is peace. And now that I've revealed my master plan to you, we, uh. still have a few minutes of driving left. Driver, could you put something on the radio? So, you ever play New Vegas? I was one of the characters in that. Yeah, the king. <laughs> oh, thank God it's over. We're back at the power plant. Don't know why I didn't guess this was where Sahelanthropus would be. It would be kind of hard to store anywhere else. Now the pleasantries end. The time for talk is over. He's ready to begin his final act. We have to die. So who else would he bring out to kill us than the guy we simply can't kill? The lingering will approaches. This shouldn't be too bad. When we first saw him at the hospital, it was made abundantly clear that he was allergic to water. When we first saw him at the devil's house, it was made abundantly clear that he was allergic to water. So all I have to do is soak him and... Uh, oh, no, oh no, I did not bring my water pistol. The one time I decide not to bring it and this fucking guy shows up. Okay, we're gonna have to improvise. Uh, in the meantime, could you stop getting so close? Oh, this is bad. Got a spike on the RWR. Strange PRF. What's wrong? Control lost. Can't maintain RPM. We're settling. Huh? You... You good? What happened? Even Skullface is confused. This was not part of the plan. Wait! And that wasn't part of the plan either. Don't you control the psychic? Such a lust for revenge! Oh! A lust for revenge? Wait, is he only controlled by who has the strongest emotions? That would explain why he changed his appearance to resemble who was controlling him. But if it's not Skullface or the man on fire, who's doing this? Who would have such a desire for vengeance that it overlaps everyone around he- Sahalanthropus is online. I repeat, Sahalanthropus is online. No one's safe this time. XOF is getting stomped. This is not working. I can't outrun this thing, and it's blaring MP3s of what dinosaurs supposedly sounded like. I have to rely on XOF attempting to take it down as a distraction, but it's not lasting long. This thing can obliterate tanks and helicopters with a metallic Archaea sword that they must have installed since last time. As a matter of fact... Cypher will rewrite the records, and I will vanish from human memory. But the thirst for revenge that I have planted will infest the system! Major... I'm burning up! Get out of there! Uh, 
Oh, oh yeah, I zoned out, sorry. Can someone come pick me up? I'm scared. Pequod 2? The other helicopter? I, I can't beat this thing, there's no way. I couldn't do it last time. Damn it, I'm screwed! Push. Pause. This is a bad situation. Of course it is. Ain't the first one we've been in. We survived the toughest things that this cruel world has to offer, and I'm not just talking about nine plus years ago. Since we got to Afghanistan, we took on the Soviets, the Skulls, Walker Gears, three different PFs. Mother Base was attacked again, and we survived. We faced a plague, and we survived. Right now, Skullface is buried under some rubble, bleeding out. While we get knocked down for the umpteenth time and once again get up, dust ourselves off, and ready ourselves for the next blow. Maybe we aren't saints, maybe we're just cockroaches, but that doesn't mean we aren't damn good at it. If Sahalanthropus becomes public, the world will get thrown into a frenzy. Vocal cord parasite or not, it could mean the end of civilization as we know it. Like always, we can't let that happen. We couldn't beat it before, but we're stronger now. We have tools that no one else does. Tools that could bring its upright stance to a pathetic grovel. We're better than a kid playing with a toy. We will win. Now cue that overly hype music! All right, all right, hold your horses. No need to be so dramatic. <laughs> we can kiss later. We still have some business to attend to. Oh, and Eli, you are so grounded when we get home. You and your little psychic friend over there. But before that... Let's see skull face. You alive over here? Ah, good. I was starting to think we'd be robbed of our revenge as well. You love robbing people of things, don't you? I'll be disposing of these, thank you very much. Don't want any more languages being terrorized, do we? Finish me. Kill me. No, not yet. You had your chance to speak, and now it's my turn. And I've got something important that I need to tell you. You're a pretty bad villain. Even by Metal Gear standards, and it's not like every bad guy in the series is a winner. But you? You're a special kind. One whose feats far outweigh his own character. What you did to Chico and Paz, what you did to MSF, the Devil's House. By all accounts, you're a piece of shit. But it's weird. I get angry when I think about those things, but when I'm staring at you, 
I just get bored. Because just as a person, you're rather boring. What, you lost your culture so now everyone has to feel that pain? That's ridiculous, unrealistic, downright idiotic. But most of all, yawn-inducing. No wonder no one's gonna remember you. You're not memorable. All honesty, this was more about the journey than the destination. We destroyed Sahalanthropus, XOF has a bunch of bloody stains on the floor, and the parasite is gone. You dying here is really secondary. You rank in the villain tier list down with Hot Coldman, and his name was Hot Coldman. And in the end, you lost control because of a child who's gonna end up being better at your job. But, while you're still here, you might as well serve your final purpose as the target of our revenge. So, <clears throat> this is for MSF. This is for Chico. This is for Pequod. Fuck off me! This is for everyone who died from the parasite! This is for burdening me with the trumpet! This is for Gohan! And this... This is for me. Do it yourself. Mission complete, boss. A fitting end, making him suffer the pain we did. Exactly what he wanted to do to the world. But he doesn't need to worry, because his time in this world is coming to an end. I, I did it! Revenge! We should eat him. It's done. We did it. The world is safe, for now. And our vengeance has been exacted. We brought ourselves from the dirt to the skies once again. We couldn't have done it alone. Kaz, Ocelot, Code Talker, Quiet, Pequod, Silent Mastodon, D-Horse, D-Dog, Huey, and D-Walker. Would I call them friends? No. In war, there's no room to make friends. They're my comrades in arms, and it would have been impossible without them. With XOF eliminated, we can finally continue on as we did all those years ago. A military without a banner, soldiers without a cause. Where the void in our souls was created, we fill with the monument of our victory. Sahalanthropus stands tall, non-functional, but there. Almost like a guardian of Diamond Dogs, watching over us. A reminder of what we must not become. Still. At the end of the day, my arm is still gone. Chico's still gone. Pequod's still gone. Nothing will ever bring them back. And yet, I still feel them. I still hear their idle chit-chat. I still feel them suffering like they're all still here. Would they like seeing what's become of us? Who knows? What matters is the present. There's always more work to do. More people that need saving. More people that need silencing. That's what we do best. We're dogs of war. Killers. No trumpet can determine that, nor can it change it. Nonetheless, time moves on uncaring, and we know what comes next. Cypher will be rebranded to the Patriots once the AI takes full control, and Diamond Dogs will morph into something more twisted. And those two things will shape the future of this world. All that's left to do is to let the circle complete itself. It's time to shed the skin of the venomous snake. We are Big Boss. Welcome to Outer Heaven. Since this game's release, quite a lot's happened. As we've gone over, Kojima parted ways with Konami and formed his own studio. KJP 2.0 went on to make Death Stranding. The game received mixed reviews. My opinion is... Nothing. I haven't played the game for more than a few hours. I was pulled away from it by the desire to make this series of videos. I'll probably get back to it soon. More recently, Death Stranding 2 was announced at the Game Awards. Jeff Keighley came about it as he usually does, bless him. Not enough is known as of writing this, so... Yippee! There's also rumblings about a secret project in the works alongside DS2. One Kojima said he always wanted to make. So this will either be the greatest game yet created, or the worst game yet created. On Konami's end, not much I'm afraid. 
the Metal Gear IP has gone completely cold. They tried doing a few things with it. First, they added some DLC to this game in the form of costumes and literal horse armor, but then they went ahead and released Metal Gear Survive. I have no opinion on this one either, as I've never even touched it, nor do I intend to. It looks about as soulless as I've heard it is, and I don't want to financially support that. The only positive about the game that I've heard is that the team working on it snuck in an easter egg saying KJP forever. That's pretty cool, but also kinda sad. They did their usual pachinko bullshit as well, but after that, nothing for like five years. But recently, there was an announcement of a new remaster collection that promises to be the best way to play them all. And on top of that, Metal Gear Solid Delta, a full-on remake of MGS3. That's exciting news and all, but I'd like you to temper your expectations. MGS3 is already a fantastic game, and with Konami's recent track record, I fear for its quality. But hey, here's hoping this comment ages poorly. After they're done with that, I honestly think the series should rest in peace. Say what you want about Kojima, but without him, the series will never be the same. No point in beating a buried horse skeleton. We've explored basically every part of the timeline that needs exploring, and even a few that didn't. The story is about as complete as it can be. And to this guy, that's enough. Well, we finally did it. After over a year, this video series is coming to a close. I guess that means it's time to give my final thoughts. I mean, that's how these usually go. You might be surprised at what I'm about to say considering the title. Metal Gear Solid V is one of the greatest games ever made. I mean that with 100% sincerity, there's no lie this time. It may have problems and a hefty amount of them, but the pros far, far outweigh the cons. It's one of the most fun experiences you could have with a video game. But it seems that that isn't a well-known fact in the community, and I wanted to see if I could do anything to change that. You see, back when I made the Kingdom Hearts 3 video, I received a fair amount of comments saying things along the lines of, I agree with most of what you said, but weirdly this made me want to play the game. And while I wasn't expecting that, I wasn't upset about it at all. I mean, as I said, I only want the best for the series, I want it to continue to grow. But at the same time, it gave me an idea. If I can get people to play a game based on all the negative things I had to say, I can definitely get people to play a game based on positive things I have to say. I've seen so many people write MGS5 off after barely or never giving it a shot. They get bored after two hours and put it down forever, and that never sat right with me. My goal with this video, besides money, was to get you playing this game by showing you the fun that you can have with it if you get creative. I mean, I use some inventive strategies at times, but can you imagine how many ideas I missed? Ideas you might have had yourself while watching? You might have noticed that I slowed down when it came to showing cool strategies and side objectives as the series went on. That's not because the game got more restrictive. I intended to hook you with part two and get you wondering about what else there is after it. I don't want to give you every single detail from the game, there are things that I want you to discover for yourself. I've been keeping a very close eye on the comments for each part, and I'm happy to report that my strategies worked on a good number of people. To all those who gave it a fair shake thanks to me, I sincerely hope you had a great time. And I also hope you learned something about the game you didn't know before from this series of videos. I was validated on that by reading the comments too. Hell, a few comments taught me some things I didn't know you could do. And as for the rest of you, I've tried to be subtle about it up until this point, but now that I've revealed my intentions to you, I'm just gonna tell you flat out. Play Metal Gear Solid V The Phantom Pain. If you haven't given it a shot, or if you have but didn't really get into it, play it. Because I don't think there will be another opportunity. I believe that this is a once-in-a-lifetime game. A true passion project that simply can't be replicated. The game's legacy unfortunately revolves around the controversy between Kojima and Konami, and I think it deserves more than that. It should be seen as the swan song to a fantastic series that had the same love poured into it that all the others did. And it certainly shouldn't be taken for granted. I love this game. But I fear that there will never be another like it. And that really sucks.
Uh, testing, testing. Okay, I'm surprised this thing's working. It's old, you never know. So the date is May 30th, 2022. I recently put out part one of MGS5 Sucks and I Love It. I have some more grand plans for this one than I did for my previous videos. I suppose the MGS Trilogy videos were a bit of a prototype to that. Something about Metal Gear really milks the creative juices out of me. Maybe I should rephrase that. Nah. I don't know if I'll end up following through, but I certainly hope I do. What I do know is that some weird stuff has been going on. Some odd captions have been popping up on both Part 1 and test uploads of Part 2. It's really been bugging me, like, it's really annoying. And every time I think about it, some weird melody starts playing in my head. It sounds like some kind of trumpet, but it's too quiet to tell. That's not the only one, either. It's not always a trumpet. One time I heard one that sounded like a xylophone or a marimba. It was hard to describe. I don't know if this will continue, but... I'm oddly tempted to keep the captions up. Maybe a viewer will be able to figure out what it means. In case this audio is made public and you're potentially that viewer, well, firstly, I hope you enjoy what you've been seeing so far, but also, let me leave you with this message. Some things are meant to be looked into. You really need to open your eyes to find a hidden meaning. So, try to do that. Hell, open a third eye if you can. Don't entrench yourself in any lies, you'd be doing me a massive favor. After all, putting the pieces together will make things clearer. Try to find where the truth is. Well, I'm off to do... whatever project I've decided to do next at this point. I tend to take my sweet time with this stuff, but maybe it won't be as painful of a wait this time. First, I'm gonna make a sandwich, though. I'm hungry. Wait, shit, did I get bread at the supermarket? Oh, whatever. Hopefully, I'll be back before you can count to five.